Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the city council. And before we start our regularly scheduled agenda, we have a special resolution today, which is declaring 2020 Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Week. And I will turn this over to Council Vice President Jenkins and Councilmember Schrader to make the presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Council President, as well as um, Councilmember Ellison, who is joining us too. Um, you know, as a um, member of the MS community, I am really proud to be able to um, to share this resolution in support of Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Week to bring attention to um, um, a community of, of individuals that are dealing with this um, autoimmune disease as well as other autoimmune diseases. It's really important in this day um, when we have these um, infectious viruses that are spreading around the country and around the world that we understand some of these vulnerable populations that may be even more compromised in the event of this pandemic. And so I'm really proud to stand with my colleagues to recognize um, the 2020 Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Week. And whereas multiple sclerosis, MS, is a neurological disease of the nerve, central nervous system affecting nearly one million people in the United States alone, and whereas multiple sclerosis generally strikes people in the prime of their life between the ages of 20 through 50, and the cause and course of the often debilitating symptoms of MS remain unknown and no cure currently exists. And since 1946, the Multiple Sclerosis Society has been a driving force for MS research, relentlessly pursuing uh, treat prevention, treatments, and a cure, and has invested more than $1 billion in groundbreaking research. And funds raised through the National Multiple Sclerosis Society has fueled $38.7 million, um, investing in 123 new research projects at the best medical centers, universities, and other institutions throughout the United States and abroad, leading to many breakthroughs in the treatment of MS and... Whereas stopping MS in its tracks, restoring what has been lost, and M M ending MS forever is the mission of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and one that all Americans and Minnesotans should support. And whereas the city of Minneapolis recognizes the importance of finding the cause and cure of MS, and expresses its appreciation for the dedication that the National Multiple Sclerosis Society Upper Midwest has shown towards creating a world free of MS. Now or okay. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the city council do hereby affirm March eighth through the fourteenth, two thousand and twenty, as Multiple Sclerosis MS Awareness Week, and do commend this observance to all of our residents. We encourage all residents of Minneapolis to learn more about multiple sclerosis and what they can do to support individuals with MS and their families. Thank you. And we have a word from Council Member Schrader. No, thank you, Council Vice President. This is a, a very important issue for me with the uh, multiple members of my immediate family have that. And I think, um, I don't think people realize how new this, the uh, information about this disease is and so what, how that affects just how, not just the people that it, have it, um, but the families and the caregivers and the community. And just, uh, I don't want to miss this opportunity to thank the MS Society uh, because it is something, just my own personal story, my, um, some of the recent breakthroughs we've been able to see. We just had my mom's been able to walk much, so much better. And to see how my dad, who's been her primary caregiver for decades now, um, to be able to see them look in each other's eyes and say, well, we might be able to dance again. They haven't gotten there. I'm still still fund your research and we'll hopefully get there. Um, but it is just something I don't think people can see until they actually are that close. So just thank you for your work. Um, yeah, uh, basically similar story. When I was around 15, my mom uh, was diagnosed with MS and uh, 
And I've seen her go through those ebb and flows. You know, anybody who knows her knows that she was she was a tremendous athlete and a tri, you know triathlon uh, uh, performer. And um, she's gone through those ebbs and flows of like, does this you know what is my ability? What can I still do? Um, and to see her sort of uh, uh, kind of lean into being able to work, she's uh, she spent some time on the planning commission. She's uh, still on the school board, and uh, uh, just kind of seeing her. Um, uh, uh, and learning a lot about what it means uh, to support someone who uh, has limited mobility, I think it's something that is, you can easily overlook if it's never been an issue for you to uh, uh, step onto a curb. Uh, I took her to Cuba about two years ago, and uh, and and it was it was a tremendous experience to travel with my mom, but also um, uh, very. Uh, you, you realize just how difficult it is to get around when there aren't like ramps onto the street and onto the sidewalk and all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, so yeah, so just thank you for all your work. And, and also just wanted to kind of come up here and recognize, uh, uh, with my colleagues and recognize my mom who's been, um, you know, fighting this, uh, for a long time. So, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, the first time that I presented this resolution, I was using a cane myself and, um, and thanks to research, thanks to awareness, thanks to uh, some breakthroughs, um, I am now cane free for the most part. Uh, haven't quite gotten back to my athlete days yet, but we're working towards that. And so um, I do want to thank uh, the MS Society and all the efforts that um, you guys do, do here locally as well as nationally and around the world. And so uh, it is a great honor to be able to recognize the work that you do and to lift up awareness around this issue. Thank you so much. And please, if you want to share any words, um, we will give you that opportunity. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you for continuing to champion this issue. I'll just add really quickly, I can see the emotion um, as my colleagues speak. And I just want to thank each of you for sharing your personal journey and stories because I think it is really empowering for people who are impacted by anything, um, by medical condition, to break through stigma, to get connected to resources like the MS Society. Um, so I know it's not always easy to put our personal lives and selves out there. And each of you have done that bravely and just want to commend you and lift up that power that um, I think we all see when, when we do that. So thank you, each of you, Council Vice President and my colleagues for that. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for being here today. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'll call to order this regular meeting of the City Council for March 13th and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Here. Palmasano. Present. Gordon. Is absent. Cano. Here. Reich. Here. Fletcher. Here. Jenkins. Here. Schrader. Here. Orsami. Present. Cunningham is absent. Ellison. Present. Goodman. Present. President Bender. 
Here. There are 11 members present. Let the record reflect that there is a quorum. Um, we have a number of uh, amendments to today's agenda with a number of items moving unexpectedly. I thought today's meeting was going to be brief and very straightforward, but we know we have to be prepared for the unexpected. So I do have three motions to amend the agenda. They are all in front of you. Um, on behalf of myself and others and city business. So, um, and then I will also pause, of course, to see if others have any other amendments. So the first item to include under the order of new business, I'll move to amend the agenda to include the appointment of the executive director of the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. We received a letter from the chair of the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority board yesterday afternoon. Um, and they have, um, they have themselves made the decision to appoint Abdi Warsami as the director of the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. This is subject to council approval. So um, in order to um, work together with them to fill the position as they're transitioning their interim director out uh, is leaving for another job, this would be then going to HPD next cycle and back to the planning or back to the full city council in two weeks. So that is a motion to amend the agenda under the order of new business for that item. The second motion is to include under the order of adjournment a security briefing as part of a closed session related to the emergency response procedures attended to the public health and safety considerations related to the um, COVID-19 virus. Um, we also have prepared a um, update for the public health the peace committee on monday as well as a public safety meeting on wednesday and during this item i have a um Oh, sorry, and then I have a third item as well, but that would be a closed session for council members to be able to hear those specific issues related to health and security. I want to assure the public that there's no secret, um, um, you know, items being discussed there. Uh, the mayor will be um, participating in a press event with the governor later today, and we have many mechanisms to share information with the public planned as well. And then the third uh, item, the motion to amend the agenda would be a motion by me um, to order uh, include under the order of new business a staff direction related to some external preparations that are underway um, in related to our community response to the COVID-19 um, virus. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list and it does not include all the preparations that are happening for our internal um, preparations as a workplace that will be um, part of the discussion at the closed session, uh, briefings of council members and the two committee meetings that are happening next week. Um, so I want to assure folks that this is not an exhaustive list, but it is intended to give uh, direction and signal to our staff who are already working on preparations to support residents and businesses that they have the support of city leadership and the city council. And this reflects a lot of things that we heard at a leadership meeting yesterday. So uh, apologies for the long winded descriptions for each of these, but those are three motions. Uh, I items to uh, move to amend the agenda. Of course, each will have their own discussion later. Are there any other uh, items to amend the agenda? I don't see any. Is there any discussion on those three items? Seeing none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Those carry and the uh, agenda has been amended. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? So moved. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. That carries and the agenda is amended. The next item is consideration of the minutes from our February 28th meeting. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. That carries and those minutes are accepted. And finally, we have the referral of matters to proper standing committees in the next cycle. May I have that motion? So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. That carries and those referrals are made. The next order of business is reports from our standing committees. And first, we have the report from our Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. The Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee is bringing seven items forward for approval this morning. Item number one is a new business license. Item two are liquor license approvals. Item three are the liquor license renewals. You'll note there are 113 of those moving forward today. Item four are the gambling license approvals. Five and six are rental dwelling license reinstatements. And item number seven is uh, the lease termination agreement for the property at 10 West Lake Street, which is terminating the lease with uh, Kmart. Um, and that has been much discussed, which is probably the largest item on today's agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, happy to move items one through seven for approval this morning. Council Member Goodman has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? 
I don't see any others. I will put myself in queue. Um, we have talked a lot about the lease uh, agreement with Kmart, but it is just such a momentous uh, moment that I just want to pause and really especially thank and lift up the contributions of so many people who laid the groundwork for us getting to this moment. Um, you know, a lot of times um, the work that we do while we get to be in these chairs, while we get to be in these roles is building on the work of others um, who have um, laid the groundwork. And um, this is the case uh, so much with this project, um, which is focused on reopening Nicollet Avenue at Lake Street. In the 1970s, a uh, store was built across our roadway. It's an important pedestrian connection. It's important transit connection citywide, reaching across the city north to south. Um, and, and it is a huge priority for the community who lives around this site where they've been disconnected and cut off. And frankly, the um, place has really been designed around car travel through the neighborhood instead of those important community connections. And so this project really became a priority for the city because of those community leaders who stepped up and, and asked us to take action. Um, the city first took a uh, formal action on this in 1998. Um, and council member Robert Lilligren was instrumental in bringing, in move, putting all of the pieces in place that it took to get us here, uh, developing a small area plan in coordination with community leader, leaders at the Whittier Alliance, Lindale organization, the business associations nearby, and so many community partners um, who are there today ready to be partners still as we go forward. Council, former council vice president Elizabeth Glidden uh, and I had monthly meetings um, for the entire four years of last term, we met every single month, um, putting, you know, putting those pieces in place, building off of the work that council member Lilligren and others had laid down in, um, with the support and guidance and help of the chairs, council member Goodman at the time, um, and still the economic development, uh, chair and council member Reich, the transportation and public works chair, council president Barb Johnson was a supporter of getting the funds in place when we needed to quickly act, um, and but all of the mayors who've been in office, Mayor Ryback, Mayor Hodges, Mayor Fry, have been supporters and advocates for this project. So all of that uh, work is so appreciated, and I wanted to highlight all of it. Um, I do want to say a couple of things about what will happen going forward. Um, and, and also pause and just thank so much the staff who've put in you know, countless hours getting us here. And we're so smart and strategic. I said this in committee, but it's often difficult for a public entity to um, act in the private market. We can't move as quickly as private actors. We can't, um, you know, often we have limitations in budget that private sector may not have as as much constraint. And our staff led by David Frank in three different roles at CPED have been nimble and strategic. Mr. Frank built relationships with folks at three different private entities that were needed to have agreements with the city in order to gain full control of this site and reopen Nicollet Avenue. And his team uh, has been extraordinary in moving quickly when needed, in, in, you know, in keeping the communication lines open when things are moving slowly and really are um, the reason that we are here today. I truly believe it's because of David Frank's efforts and the efforts of his team. Uh, we have so many partners in the city attorney's office and the city coordinator's office and the public works department who've been there as, um, as supporters and collaborators. And then now going forward, you know, I think all of us are so excited to imagine the future of this site. There is extraordinary opportunity to connect pedestrian connections to make a safe and vibrant street, to build a transit connection that is more um, inviting and reliable for residents, not just there in the immediate neighborhood, but citywide. Um, but we also know that this is a neighborhood and an area of our city that is undergoing extraordinary pressure and displacement today. The Whittier neighborhood, which I represent, is 90% renter, and I believe it is one of the most um, quickly um, changing neighborhoods in our city where folks are constantly at risk of losing their homes, where we have many small businesses, many immigrant-owned businesses that are renting their property and are also at risk for displacement. So I just want to say so very clearly that everything that 
um, even the very preliminary discussions that have taken place so far with policymakers and staff are really aimed at both of those goals of thinking big about our future, looking out 50 years or more and understanding how this can help us meet our sustainability and our race equity goals, our city building goals, creating, um, again, a more connected neighborhood here, but also understanding that the people who live there today, who own the businesses today, will be front and center and especially putting every measure we can in place to ensure that this is an inclusive and affordable and welcoming place for the people who are there today going forward. We've already had conversations with the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority about incorporating, um, you know, public housing here p potentially with the land trust on both the housing and the commercial side. We have strong partners in the community. Of course, there's public housing very nearby here as today. Um, so all of those partners are ready to go. I know many more um, in the community and throughout our city um, community are ready to pitch in and help meet these dual goals of dreaming about the future, but also honoring the contributions of the people who are there today and protecting the most vulnerable in our community. So I'm excited to work with all of you, my colleagues, with the mayor, with the community here uh, to reach those goals. And again, so thankful to all the work that got us to this moment. Um, we look forward to cutting the ribbon. I promised Council Member Lilligren that he would be uh, the person like cutting the ribbon or, you know, I don't know, hitting the mallet into the wall. <laughs> so I, uh, I stand by that promise to him and I'm excited for that day and all the moments to come in this project. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And thank you for that, uh, for those words and those reassurances that, um, um, a deep concern for, um, anti-displacement, um, will be exhibited, you know, as, as, a policy aid to both of the aforementioned council members. Um, I have attended the vast majority of all those conversations that you um, noted. And today is just a really emotional and exciting day, I think, for, for all the people you name, but, but even more importantly for the, the community. I mean, you run into people in that community all the time in the Whittier neighborhood and the East Phillips neighborhood and Powderhorn and Central neighborhoods and Lindale. And the first question that comes up is, when are you going to reopen Nicollet? And, um, and we are finally able to, to say soon. Um, you know, Relative to um, Council Member Lilligren, you know, I think he left us uh, an example of how to do development um, without displacement, um, and that model would be the Midtown Global Market. And I think we can um, look to that as a as a blueprint for how we can create um, a really um, I think responsive and responsible um, developments in that area. So I'm really excited to work with all the staff and the community to come up with a plan. And um, yeah, it's just a really exciting day. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or discussion? Seeing none, Clerk, Kirk, oh my gosh, Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. <clears throat> Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Pender. <clears throat> Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next report is from our Enterprise Committee, which will be presented by the Chair, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. There are two items being brought forward from the Enterprise Committee meeting this cycle. The first is gift accepts acceptance for some travel to Cleveland State University for the Smart Cities Surveillance and Privacy Conference. This is for our staff member, J.P. Heisel. I do want to mention that um, since this time that we had Enterprise Committee, this event has been canceled. But um, it does say there may be an opportunity to reschedule. So I think the best action here is just to continue to move forward with this motion. Should it be rescheduled sometime 
you know, this year. Uh, and item number two is a contract with Be Fresh Productions for the future of our community media access services to manage public access television. The uh, owners and operators of Be Fresh came to committee and we had a short presentation on this. I move both of these items for approval. Councilmember Palmasano has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next report is from the Housing Policy and Development Committee. And I see Councilmember Gordon is here. It'll be given by Chair Gordon. Thank you, President Bender. The Housing Policy and Development Committee is bringing forward two contract amendments for your consideration today. The first is an amendment with Minneapolis Public Housing Authority for the Stable Home, Stable Schools initiative. And the second is a contract amendment with Ellie May for Loan Administration Software Services. I will move both items for approval. Councilmember Gordon has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Hanno. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next report is from our Intergovernmental Relations Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. The Intergovernmental Relations Committee brings forward one item today. It's an amendment to our legislative agenda and policy positions related to catalytic converters. I will uh, note that the language on the agenda is a little off from what was passed at committee. Uh, what uh, we passed at committee wasn't regarding the use of technology. It was uh, greater regulation and enforcement uh, from the state to help stem the tide of catalytic converter thefts, which are really affecting a lot of uh, working people across the city. I'll go ahead and move uh, that amendment to the agenda or uh, to our legislative agenda. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. I'm just pausing to see where it's okay. We're bringing the. I see. the The resolution is under TPW. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for I ninety four. Yep. Two fifty two. That'll Thank be you, Council TPW. Member. Um, Council Member Johnson has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That item, those items carry and the report is adopted. The next report will come from the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights and Engagement Committee presented by the Vice Chair, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much, President Bender. The um, Peace Committee is bringing forward two items. The first is a grant application to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for a strategic prevention framework um, to support the Partnership for Success um, efforts, or that's the grant. Uh, and the second item is accepting a small addition to a grant from the uh, Statewide Health Improvement Partnership Funds. This is um, $5,000 to support walkable community workshops and the action plan implementation for the Glendale townhomes. I will move both items forward for approval. Councilmember Gordon has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries on that report is adopted. The next report is from our Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Cano. Thank you, Madam President. And the uh, Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee has two items to bring forward today. One is authorizing a contract with the University of Minnesota Veterinary Medical Center for Police Canine Health Services. And item number two is accepting a grant from the, from the Women's Foundation of Minnesota for grant expenses related to the testing of the sex assault exam kits. And with that, um, I move these two items forward, these two items forward and stand for any questions. Councilmember Cano has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. 
Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and those items are adopted. The next report is from the Transportation and Public Works Committee, given by the Chair, Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The committee will be moving forward with 11 items today. Uh, item one is the 2020 Street Resurfacing Program for the Fuller South Residential Designation. Two is also for the Fuller South Residential uh, Street Resurfacing Project approval, and pr approval of the assessments. Three is the 37th Avenue Northeast Street Resurfacing Project approval and assessment. Four is the Airway Abandonment at 2303 Kennedy Street, uh, and 2330 Kennedy Street, and 2345 Kennedy Street, and there's an assessment associated with that. Five, there's the Wordplay Large Block Event Permit for May 9th. Uh, six is the Rock the Garden lar Large Block Event for June 20th. Seven is the Minnesota Green Corps Program application to host Green Corps member for the 2020 and 2021 program year. Eight is the contract amendment with Egan Companies Incorporated for the Lemington and Hoff parking ramps relating retrofit project. Nine is the cooperative construction agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for Third Avenue South Bridge Project Rotter Main and Traffic Infrastructure. Ten is the joint powers agreement with MnDOT for the Third Avenue Bridge Project uh, regarding the traffic control mitigation plan. And 11 is the Highway 252 I-94 Min Pass expansion project, and there's a resolution associated with that uh, stating uh, community and uh, city priorities. I move all items, Madam President. Councilmember Rake has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Ellison. I uh, just wanted to say quickly that uh, I want to thank my colleagues for and everyone who's involved in help cra crafting the resolution. Uh, and that I think that uh, because of council members being sick, myself being sick, council member Cunningham being sick, uh, there's a, a staff direction that we weren't able to pull together, but that we will be working with the reaching out to the uh, city attorney's office to uh, talk about a future staff direction related to this item. That's all. Thank you, council member Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I would like to do two, uh, note two things. This was forwarded without recommendation, so I will move um, as amended through the committee work that we did. And given that that work was carried by uh, three of my colleagues, I wish they would be named uh, formally uh, by the clerk. That would be Ellison, uh, Bender, and uh, Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Schrader. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just want to thank the four colleagues that have worked on this and just also make it very clear that this is not a North Minneapolis issue. This is uh, an issue that affects all of Minneapolis. Uh, the same kind of thing was proposed on the 35W expansion. Um, my constituents and others stood up, demanded transit, demanded a better plan, and got that. And that is exactly what we're expecting to happen. Uh, that needs to happen in North Minneapolis as well. Thank you, Councilmember Schrader. I put myself in queue. We had some discussion about this at the IGR committee um, the other day on Wednesday, but I did just want to reiterate to um, my support for Councilmember Ellison and Cunningham. I was able to attend a policymaker meeting with them along with folks from MnDOT and Metro Transit, the county, and the other project partners. And, um, you know, things are moving very quickly uh, for this project in some ways, but it is also a very long-term project in other ways. And I think we're at a critical turning point where decisions are being made about the scope of the project, the scope of the environmental review. Uh, you know, w the time is now or, or even potentially a bit past and late for us to um, have the pieces in place to have transit ready to go as part of this project. And so we were really encouraged at that meeting to be clear about the city's position. And I think my colleagues have said it, but I'll re re reiterate that the city of Minneapolis position on this project is that we need to guard the health and well-being of our residents in North Minneapolis who are still suffering the impacts of the I-94 corridor cutting through their neighborhood to begin with. And that transit is a non-negotiable piece of this project for us um, from a standpoint of transportation equity, of equity across our city enterprise, and as we did with the 35W corridor for us here, um, our standards are equal for our residents in North Minneapolis to have access to mitigate the harm of freeway, um, you know, the existing freeway and freeway expansion in their community. And we feel, I think, very strongly that, um, you know, standing together with community members in these three communities that are impacted by the project, there's a lot of concern from folks about uh, traffic volumes almost doubling through their communities and the uh, air quality and environmental health impacts of that. 
there's remaining concerns about the freeway itself and um, about lack of mitigation for past harms. Uh, there's concern about the loss of homes uh, as proposed as part of the expansion project outside of the borders of Minneapolis. So uh, I think we stand in solidarity with those um, within our community and um, in the other communities who are raising these concerns. So again, appreciate so much the leadership of our colleagues, Ellison and Cunningham, and reiterate our um, my support and I think the body's support for their leadership. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you very much. I just wanted to pile on a little bit here too. I think it's really significant that the city is on record now opposing the current design that's coming forward and we are expecting it to improve and to be a lot better. Um, I think this is probably just the beginning of what's going to be an ongoing um, effort and challenge to make sure that we get um, what the uh, people deserve out of this um, project. And I'm glad that we're able to go on record and, and state our position so carefully and articulately. So appreciate that. And, and let's see if we can't really make a big difference here. Thank you. Councilor Ellison. Yeah, I'll keep my second comment short just because I, you know, I figured I said most of this at, at committee, but I just wanted to reiterate that there are a number of other uh, city council members and mayors from other affected cities who are uh, who, who are part of all the same meetings we were a part of and who are feeling similarly about the design. And so we're also not just standing on um, the priorities for our own city, but also standing in solidarity with uh, with cities who are affected by this corridor as well. Um, and also for um, you know, for anyone at, at home, I know our ratings at the city council here are way up, um, who, who are tuning in and wondering sort of like, okay, what's going on with 94 and 252? Um, you know, just as a bit of background, I'll keep it very short. Um, uh, 94 um, it was a highway that really that really uh, decimated communities, multiple communities, uh, uh, black communities uh, along, uh, along its path. Um, and so... And so I think it can be easy to just say, like, okay, this is the existing highway. What's there to sort of, like, uh, 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 care about here? Uh, but I think it's really important that uh, that, that be noted that, that when you – that there are people who are still living in North Minneapolis today who, 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 who very much so remember um, – the damage that 94 caused. And even for folks like myself who have never lived life without 94 right there in the community, uh, we've heard the stories and we know. Um, and that that's not just true for North Minneapolis, but it's also true for the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. Uh, so, and, and, that the, and that the damage caused was so much so that in Rondo, there's actually a project called Reconnect Rondo uh, uh, that's talking about a, a building a land bridge. Uh, and that's far off and that's sort of, uh, 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 it's a lofty goal to, to sort of cap a freeway. It's very expensive, but it's the it's uh, the the freeways cause so much damage that, that those are the types of solutions that people are looking for. We're not asking for that here. Uh, here we're talking about making sure that we do not disrupt the existing connectivity uh, and that um, and that we don't expand the freeway. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of clarify, you know, for anyone at home looking and saying this seems like a very technical issue. What is there to really care about here? That that's sort of the some of the history and, and some of the impact that uh, uh, that we're looking to address and, and and in the future undo. So that's it. Thank you. Councilman Reich. I absolutely did not want to have the last word on this, but uh, in, in Councilmember Cunningham's absence, uh, we may not be pushing for a lid at this point in time, but if that uh, if our esteemed colleague gets his way with tricking out Dowling Avenue Bridge the way he wants, it'll be pretty darn close. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Vice President. I wanted to make sure that Councilmember Reich did not get the last word. Um, and I will add, only add that, you know, in, in South Minneapolis, um, very, very similar um, impacts of 35W um, have created many of the same issues um, that Councilmember Ellison described, as well as just separating the communities. Um, we recently installed a new pedestrian bridge um, that will reconnect communities. It's an artist design, um, pedestrian bridge designed by, um, Setu Jones, a renowned, internationally renowned artist, um, who grew up in the neighborhood and, and actually witnessed the disruption of 35W, uh, as well as the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul that was mentioned. And I think, you know, we have um, seen the power of standing up to um, 
the forces that want to expand freeways in our communities um, through the the efforts and the work of um, former council member Robert Lilligran, as well as former council vice president Elizabeth Glidden, who has just walked into the room um, and and really um, stood firm to say that we will not allow um, the expansion of our freeways, particularly without a transit option. And so um, this resolution today is really important step to, to reaffirm our commitment to our communities. And, and I think it's really gonna create more safety. It helps us to meet our goals of um, uh, eliminating the greenhouse impact of more cars traveling on our freeways. And so I'm, I'm really um, thrilled about this uh, development and proud to support it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further discussion? I won't count this as the last word, um, but I, um, I think I will add just um, that uh, there is a meeting coming up, um, the next meeting of the um, the policy group that has been meeting will include, um, I think, leadership from MnDOT and Metro Transit. Their staff have been there, of course, and we're at this last meeting that we had. But I believe that there's a lot of shared value uh, there in the leadership of MnDOT and Metro Transit. It's just often, I think, with infrastructure projects, a matter of aligning uh, our funding sources and our project timelines with those values and making sure um, that those values are front and center. Um, and so I think, again, that the council, the city council members who were there have stated this very clearly verbally. And I think this um, action will just reinforce our position with our project partners and make it easier to figure out how to move forward uh, on the safety improvements that were the intended uh, impetus for this project. So thanks for everyone's comments. Is there anything else? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Kano. Aye. Wright. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and those items are adopted. The next report comes from the Ways and Means Committee, given by the Chair, Councilmember Warsami. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee brings 11 items to approval today. Item number one is a legal settlement workers' compensation claim of Brandy Steiberg. Item number two is a legal settlement workers' compensation claim, claim of John Ellen. Item number three is a legal settlement claim of Abdi Hassan. Item number four is a legal settlement uh, Anthony Kelly versus Bernix et al. versus the city of Minneapolis. Item number five is an amicus status in lawsuits challenging federal administration's climate action-related policies. Item number six is a lease of city-owned land bounded by 2nd to 3rd Avenue South and 3rd to 4th Street South to Stahl Construction Company. Item number seven is, is an easement agreement with Tingle Town Development LLC for shared driveway at 5400, uh, 5416, and 5426 Nicollet Avenue. Item number eight is a contract amendment with Wells Fargo Bank NA for banking services, and this is for bank accounts, check-in, and related services. Item number nine is a 2019 budget closing adjustment. Item number 10 is a capital long-range improvement committee click appointment, and this is approving the council appointment of Devin Wise for seat 10, Ward 5, to fill an unexpired two-year term beginning January 1st, 2019, and ending December 31st, 2020. And the final item is a 2020 Local Board of Appeal on Equalization, and I move approval of all 11 items. Council Member Rosami has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Ano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and the report is adopted. The final committee report comes from Zoning and Planning, given by the Chair, Councilmember Schrader. Thank you, Madam President. The Zoning and Planning Committee will bring is bringing forward five items for approval today. Uh, the first is the... Uh, a denial of a appeal for the conditional use permit and site plan appeal, uh, site plan review at 3326, 3338, and 3050 University Avenue Southeast. The second is the approval of a rezoning at 
3115 East 42nd Street. The third is the approving of a street vacation at 404 and 420 15th Avenue South, as well as 15, oh, excuse me, 1417 South 5th Street. Number four is the approval of uh, appointments to the Heritage Preservation Commission. Number five is the passage of an ordinance to uh, the accessory structures um, height. And I'll stand for any questions and move all for approval. Councilmember Schrader has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Gordon. I wanted to speak briefly about number one. Thank you. Um, and I did this, um, those who are on the committee know that we discussed this at length there. This is a project that's come through the council once before and it was coming back for some amendments. It was approved by the planning commission for those amendments, but it was appealed to the zoning and planning committee. Um, and I don't need to relive everything, but I th thought this is worthy of a brief speech as it, uh, I would say in my illustrious career on the city council, this has been the most difficult and challenging development projects that's come along and there's been lots of development in Ward 2 during that time period. It was particularly painful because of the division that created in the community. Um, many people see this as um, a positive development because of the housing units that it's going to bring in, the retail it's going to bring right along what I would say is the state's premier light rail line, the Green Line and the Westgate Station right on the border. Many people are deeply concerned, however, about the impacts it might have on some of the historic treasures in the area. We have the famous Prospect Park Witch's Hat Tower um, right near this. People are concerned about those views. We also have a historic district and some properties and this um, development goes very close to those. Um, each time it's come to the council, I think we've made efforts to mitigate the concerns about those and this, uh, this current version of the project is actually a little bit smaller and a little bit lower. I also really appreciate that the committee members were willing to support some added conditions. Um, and we added conditions at the committee that would pr conserve um, more of a, a, a current building that could provide valuable retail. It's also, I think a lot of people see it as ha a historic resource in the community, the art and architecture building. So now we're conserving more of that. Um, and, but we're also um, added a condition to do a better job of screening the nearest neighbors who will be most negatively impacted with this. I'm sure that there are going to be hundreds and perhaps thousands of people um, in my ward around this area who aren't necessarily happy with the results either way. Um, but I'm hopeful that um, we can help bring the community together again and work together better as more projects are coming and we've learned a lot of great lessons about um, what tools we do have and what authority we do have to preserve the historic treasures and maybe what other things we need to change in terms of our policies. I certainly appreciate the engagement of everybody in it and appreciate the, the patience and the efforts of our city staff and my colleagues up here to try to get to this resolution. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the zoning and planning report? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next order of business is reports from special committees. We have a report from the executive committee this morning given by Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. The Executive Committee brings forward three items to the Council today for consideration. Item number one is the appointment of Mark Ruff to a two-year term as City Coordinator. This item is slated to be referred to the Committee of the Whole for scheduling of a public hearing. Item number two is a collective bargaining agreement with the ASME water unit. And item number three is an agreement with the Teamsters Convention Center Custodians Unit. These two are slated to be referred to the Ways and Means Committee for consideration. And I move the Executive Committee report for approval. Council Vice President has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Hano. Aye. Wright. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Warsami. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Goodman. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. The next order of business is resolutions and we have an honorary resolution declaring multiple sclerosis week. Are there any further comments from council members? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. That carries and the honorary resolution is adopted. 
The next order of business is motions, and we have a motion from Council Member Palmasano to discharge from the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee further consideration of a grant application to the Department of Justice. I'll call on Council Member Palmasano to speak to that motion. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is the motion that I have been sharing with colleagues um, and the final motion that I sent out earlier yesterday. Um, I want to say this in the past couple of weeks that um, supporting Chief Arredondo and his vision will at times take both trust in the work of dedicated staff at City Hall and also political will. I'm asking you to have that today and we discussed this item and had a presentation at Public Safety. Our chief spoke for about an hour with our colleagues for their questions at Public Safety and then we discussed it again at Committee of the Whole this week. Um, I have listened to the concerns and ideas voiced by my colleagues even at the Committee of the Whole and I've really taken them to heart. Uh, I think that what I've prepared, this three staff directions that would be my second motion here, should we discharge this item, speak directly to that. Um, I want to lift up something briefly mentioned by Council Vice President Jenkins at Committee of the Whole, that there's very much a need for a dedicated traffic unit to investigate motor vehicle and pedestrian bike collisions. There have been many cases over the last several years where we have not, we've had to use our own internal civilian investigators in the city attorney's office, not MPD, to work up cases for charging because our officers don't have the bandwidth to do it. These are cases that sometimes involve a tragic fatality. I cannot imagine how that looks to the courts and to the juries and to the families of the victims where the police haven't even been able to work up those cases. A, tra a traffic and pedestrian safety unit is not simply about pulling people over. There is a real need for it and it goes to Vision Zero and the other priorities that we all support as a city. If our public safety committee wanted to have more conversation on the item, I think we would allow it to come to council for all of us to discuss it. If we wanted staff to do more with this or to provide more information, since this was referred back in February, we would have told them to do so when we referred it back to them in committee. These last several weeks since it was referred originally to that committee back in February by our council, I've been asking a lot of questions of MPD and I find them often deep in the work of emergency planning given urgent issues in our global environment. I know they're ready to ensure our first responders are ready to respond and have re needed resources. I urge my colleagues that this is not the right time to be asking MPD to provide additional analysis. So I ask that we continue this effort if we end up with the opportunity to receive these funds, which in committee with nearly an hour of the chief's time, it was explained we would not know until the August or September timeframe. So I'm moving to discharge this item from committee because because of timeliness and because I think we're ready to move forward. Um, I want to move this forward in a manner that increases transparency and that also includes the thoughtful work from Council Member Cunningham in the budget cycle. So in the motion to follow, if this is successful, there are three really important things. One is the way this money would be transparently included and considered fully in our next budget cycle. The second is even more opportunities for the public to share their feedback. A public hearing should we receive the grant monies or, and be in a position to accept them at Public Safety Committee. And item three is to ensure we are delaying reestablishment of this unit until and with the recommendations from the work group established to ensure racial disparity issues are fully addressed. These protections I think are really important. Councilmember Cunningham reached out this morning to me when he couldn't be in today and he expressed his support for discharging this item from committee so we could discuss it as a full council and discuss potential pathways to address the concerns about the grant application process. We can do engagement work around this, working with constituents and do so in a way that addresses racial disparities. We can't do any of that if it dies in committee and gets deleted from the agenda. When we choose to administratively pull that item without clarity as to how it will look when it comes back or what staff are supposed to do with it, I believe we're sending it into purgatory. 
That's all I have to say, Madam Chair, um, Madam President. I have this motion to discharge this item before you, and I move that motion. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano's motion is before us. I see council members in queue. I do want to note um, before the discussion that this motion will require the support of two thirds of the council members present in order to be successful because it is an action to discharge uh, the work from the committee and bring it to the full city council instead. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, President Bender. Uh, just wanted to respond to a couple of things. Uh, We've had most of this conversation in Committee of the Whole and a very substantive conversation, as you noted, in public safety. And I just want to um, speak to the timeliness question, uh, both because uh, it was not a given that it would uh, take this long uh, for us to see it, that we would be seeing it this late. And in fact, the deadline has passed as we debate this today. Um, uh, a quick Google search reveals cities that were voting on this as early as February 4th. Uh, so there are uh, police departments around the country that uh, brought this forward with more time for consideration. I also want to just be clear um, that I have been asking for a report, uh, asking the mayor and the chief for a report on why our racial disparities in traffic enforcement are what they are. Uh, and I even went as far as to uh, solicit credible third parties who could do that report and bring at least one proposal forward as one possible path to getting that information. We still do not have it. So this is not something that I would attribute to uh, um, timing around coronavirus and uh, the emergency of the moment in terms of asking for analysis. I've been asking for this analysis for a year since there were community members in here raising this issue back in January uh, of 2019. So I just want to be very clear that this is an ongoing conversation. And it's my view that having asked for that uh, multiple times, uh, both uh, privately with the mayor and the chief and uh, in public, that uh, at some point continuing to approve whatever funding is requested on this topic without getting answers to the questions that I have uh, is, a, is a formula for never having accountability. And I think that's really what the work of the Public Safety Committee has been is to try to create some accountability around the work that we're doing together uh, to figure out when we are making investments, as we did in our budget deal in December, uh, how are we also pairing that with the city's values and with some accountability around that? And having not received answers to my questions, it's very hard to move anything forward. So I, I just, I, I, I want to name that timeliness uh, is really not a reason to move this forward right now, that, that, that it did not have to be this way, uh, and that we've been asking for these, for this analysis. Uh, for much, much longer than this grant debate. Thank you. Uh, I put myself in queue to speak. I, I don't serve on the Public Safety Committee, um, and I know there was a robust discussion there uh, more on some of the substantive issues and um, you know the ongoing work that that committee is doing. I, I want to make a few points, though, from my perspective. First, I do want to highlight that discharging work from a committee is an unusual step to take. Um, and I would caution against drawing any particular conclusions about what precedent this might set or not um, regarding those kinds of actions. Um, but it is an unusual thing to do and something that we typically um, don't don't do because we leave the work of committees um, to happen in in committee and in this case um, I think our perspectives may differ a bit based on how we uh, approached the compromise that we made as a body with the mayor uh, during our budget process a couple of months ago so for me those compromise elements that were so important to get my support and comfort to supporting an eight million dollar annual increase in MPD's budget in December uh, those, those pieces were significant and meaningful. And that was that we were not increasing the number of sworn officers in the department. That was a critical piece of the agreement that I agreed to. Um, that we were investing instead in training to bring our capacity up to those that are authorized today. Um, for me, the pieces, the staff direction that I co-authored with Council Member Cunningham around enforcement, um, I'm serious about that. Uh, I take that very seriously. I've been working on traffic safety for 20 years, and I can tell you a, a number of things I could go on at, at length uh, about uh, the facts and what data and research shows and what, what the experience of other cities show about traffic enforcement related to traffic deaths. Um, I'll state very simply that simply reducing the speed limit eliminates crashes. 
In cities that don't increase enforcement, it eliminates crashes. We know from around the country that speed cameras and camera enforcement is the number one way to have a meaningful impact on safety and enforcement, and we are working very hard to earn the support of our legislature to be able to do that. We also know from the experience of other cities that targeted and strategic enforcement is necessary both to have a meaningful impact on street safety so that we can look our constituents in the eye and say, this is actually making you safer in the streets. Uh, and that work is forthcoming. The, the group that we set up during that staff direction hasn't even met yet. And so I take that seriously. I meant that before we established a traffic division, the work should be done, not just beginning, not contemplated for the future. Um, and, and I know my colleagues, um, many folks are more involved than I am in the staffing study, but that was also a piece of the discussion and the compromise and the agreement that we came to that enabled a lot of us to be able to support an $8 million annual investment in the police department just two months ago. And this grant, to be clear, I, I know this came up at committee, but this is the, the city agreeing to spend millions more dollars in of public money in our police department. Um, so talking about process, I think for some in the community who want us to use every single lever that we have council members to create accountability and more public transparency and more civilian oversight in our department, um, the budget is an important lever. And to come in through a backdoor process a couple of months later to commit the city to adding millions more dollars to the police department with no public hearing, with very little public discussion, um, feels uh, outside the spirit of the agreement that we made just a couple of months ago. I want to get to a place where I feel really proud of the work of our Minneapolis Police Department. And I know that we have leadership from Chief Arredondo, from the staff who are sitting in the room today, from the leadership of the department. They're working very hard to create cultural change, to create policy change, to make strategic and smart investments in our department. And I know that also as a policymaker, when our departments are going through meaningful change and transformational change, that it's important for us to have high standards and to be clear and to follow through on our direction. Our staff directions are meaningless if we don't stick with them. And so I uh, just want to underscore again that the agreement that we came to to the budget was meaningful to me. And those elements that came out of that agreement were meaningful. I stand by them. And I don't want to, um, you know, take away from the work that is happening and those progress on oh, those important elements that were part of that um, part of that discussion. So I don't think this is closing the door um, to future investments, certainly not in traffic enforcement. There's significant interest in that. I mean, it's clear the work is starting in April to put the pieces in place that we need for that to be successful. Um, so I think, um, you know, we have another budget uh, proposal coming from the mayor soon. Um, you know, he's made clear his commitment to increasing the police force and to continuing to increase the funding for the police department. So I anticipate more um, proposals in that spirit in the future. So so uh, this will be an ongoing discussion, but today I think um, it's clear to me that uh, this is um, really, um, you know, coming forward and, and just so quickly after our budget discussions in a way that I can't support. Uh, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> uh, I did want to uh, uh, thank Councilmember Palmasano for the amount of transparency in uh, forwarding this and getting this to us uh, before today. I think it's a great example of how uh, we can be transparent with each other even when we don't agree. Um, I did want to um, uh, sort of just to just to add to what my colleagues have said so far that uh, 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 the, the, the timeline piece I think is difficult. We've heard a couple of things. One is that, well, this came up so fast uh, and that uh, we didn't have time to talk to committee members and, and, and committee members weren't talked to. We did have a great discussion in committee, uh, but, but for the most part, committee members weren't, um, uh, uh, weren't talked to prior to committee about what this was, about uh, the why. Um, and even during that discussion, I think that uh, to Council Member Schrader's point, um, we, uh, we have been asking for information about how we're going to make sure we're not increasing uh, 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 racial bias in, uh, in, 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 in traffic enforcement when that has been the history of traffic enforcement. And while we got some great, uh, I think, uh, immediate responses, there was there's no plan. There's no sort of research. There's no way to implement uh, a great strategy to ensure that we do not um, sort of steep in the racial disparities when it comes to traffic enforcement. Um, and uh, and then and then also, uh, uh, again, I want to reiterate that referring this back to staff to for them to work on and for them to make sure that we have a great proposal. I don't agree that that sort of effectively kills this. Um, we know that we haven't had a uh, 
uh, uh, a COPS grant in, in a number of years, uh, partially because of a lawsuit uh, related to sanctuary cities. Um, and so uh, we can anticipate that, that these grants are going to be uh, available with more frequency. That's my understanding um, as I've gotten a little bit more familiar with this issue. Uh, and so I don't agree that, that, that we've effectively killed this in committee. I, I think that this is, uh, that we believe this needed more work. Uh, I think it's evident that it does um, and that we were earnest in saying, and uh, referring this back to staff to say, let's, let's get some more, um, uh, some more work to this. Uh, and, um, and, I, and, and to the council president's point, I do have an issue with us uh, uh, taking on, I think, two critical issues uh, that people, that the public would want to have a huge say in, and that did, that, that they did have a huge say in just a couple of months ago, and that is whether or not we're going to increase the number of sworn officers. This grant would sign us up to do that. Um, and, um, and also uh, that this grant is, uh, uh, it's not, you know, quote unquote, free money, right? It's uh, uh, it's it's 1.2, but signing the city up for 4.6 million, right? That's a that's a huge investment that we're that we're um, that we're signing up for, uh, and so uh, and so I just wanted to say that it's 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 for those reasons. Um, we don't know how we're going to ensure uh, that we don't uh, increase racial disparities. Uh, there's budget implications that the public's not a part of. Uh, there's staffing implications that the public has not been a part of. Those are the reasons that um, that I won't be uh, supporting discharging this from committee. And 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 lastly, I do think that the committee did its work and did its job in referring this back to staff. Um, uh, and so uh, for those four reasons, I won't be supporting this charging it from committee. Councilmember Schrader. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, echo the sentiments of Councilmember Ellison. I, I think that for me, I was not on the, I'm not on the committee, um, but I really feel like this is budgeting outside the budget process. It is something that in applying for the grant, it signs us up, it commits us to 10 new officers. Um, these aren't something we can just say we're going to take, put officers in different areas. This clearly states by the grant itself that it has to go over uh, and be new officers by the end of the year will be at our set amount that uh, as Councilmember Ellison has said, you know, we have had a lot of public discussion about and to have this go through outside of the budget process, outside of the budget time, outside of all of the public hearings that go along with that, um, I feel is a, a wrong precedent. Uh, the one other thing I'd like to add, I just it's a very, uh, I kind of see this pattern going on, um, and it's very frustrating that uh, the city council has a lot of leverage over most departments except for the police department. And it, it looks differently, and this is a great example of that, where um, the police department, the police chief, and the mayor have a lot of discretion to determine how that looks, how public safety looks. Um, there's a lot of leeway to come up with pilot programs, to come up with other ways to do things. But what we keep seeing and what we keep hearing is only about the budget. That is the one thing city council can say. And we're not hearing reports back on things that can be improved. We're not hearing reports back of how things can be more effective. We're not hearing what the police department is working on on its own. Um, and that would be very helpful when we're discussing the one thing that we can talk about, which is the budget, to be able to see what the police department is working on to really show that they are working on what they see as the community has brought up and working on those issues. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Again, this motion requires a two-thirds vote of council members present to be successful. How, what is two-thirds of 12? Madam sorry. President, it would be eight affirmative okay, votes. Thank you. <laughs> nice to have the clerk say that officially. Uh, seeing no more discussion, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson? Aye. Palmasano? Aye. Gordon? No. Cano? No. Reich? Aye. Fletcher? No. Jenkins? Aye. Schrader? No. Warsami? Aye. Ellison? No. Goodman? Aye. President Bender? No. There are six ayes and six nays. So that motion does not carry. Uh, but again, echoing uh, Councilor Ellison's um, comment, I do very much appreciate um, Councilor Palmasano's transparency and communication with this. And I know it is part of many ongoing discussions within the Public Safety Committee and beyond. Um, so that will stay within the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee. I know that um, Chair uh, Cano and Vice Chair Fletcher are talking with staff and each other and the clerks about the procedures for the next steps for that, but essentially it just stays with staff until the, um, you know, the, the work uh, has been completed as, as in discussion with the um, chairs. Okay, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. Um, 
I'd like to move to direct the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee to report back with its recommendation on the COPS grant application for the next regular meeting of the City Council. That would be consistent with what you just said. Uh, that is not what I said, um, but um, I'm happy to take the motion. Um, so uh, Councilman Palmasano has moved to direct the committee uh, to come back with a work product. Mr. Clerk, because could you help us with that uh, motion, which I'm not sure we've had during my time as president? Uh, Madam President, the motion I've taken down is that this is a motion to direct the Public Safety Emergency Management Committee to report back its recommendation on the COPS grant application to the full council in the next cycle. Okay, we have a motion before us. Is there any discussion on that motion? Yes. Council Member Pomisano. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I might just explain myself a little bit. Um, it, you did say that we would consider this in Public Safety Committee. Um, I thought I heard you say as early as next week or in the next cycle. Um, I would like just to ensure that we are going to do that and have something to come back to the next regular council meeting with, with a recommendation f for or against um, this grant application and not leave it undue numbers of cycles in committee. Um, okay, and, and maybe just to clarify, the, the grant deadline has passed as of today, um, as of Wednesday. Today, it has passed. Uh, as of Wednesday, it, was, it, it is uh, no longer um, open. So I, I knew now, based on the rules that we passed through our budget committee as a city council, uh, departments are required to get approval from the city council prior to uh, submitting grant applications that meet a number of criteria, as this one does, um, because it requires city matching funds, because it is over a certain dollar amount. Um, so I'm not, um, I, so my intended comment was to defer um, the next steps to the chair of the committee in conversation with the department. Um, I believe the intention of the motion at committee was to ask the department to um, fulfill some of the um, previous staff directions related to this re budget request. And um, so, I mean, I'm happy to defer to members of the committee, and I see Councilmember Ellison in queue. I uh, just wanted to say that if, uh, that if in committee we referred this back to staff and we were hoping to hear back from staff uh, some updates about traffic enforcement, uh, maybe some of the data that uh, Councilmember Fletcher has been, has been mentioning, um, uh, and that the count and that the committee this seems like it would be drastically limiting the committee's discretion which is what the committee is designed to do is have discretion and 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 interact with staff and so um, uh, and so the, so I do find the first motion I've, I fully understood both you know this motion I, I don't understand as much and so uh, I think that uh, if it's limiting the discretion of the of the committee to sort of interact with staff uh, and sort of signing us up to do one thing, then I, I feel like that's not something that I'm going to be able to support. So just wanted to name that. Thank you. Councilor Gordon. I put my name in place of the uh, committee chair who's not signed in, and I would like to yield my time to her. Councilor Marcano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am using a different laptop today, so I don't have access to that little system we all have. Um, so our agenda, of course, um, has our, our, our agenda setting meeting has already happened. Um, I um, apologize to my colleagues for having so much of the public safety work happen right now at the council meeting. That's very atypical. Um, and I find it a little bit um, disheartening uh, because we do have a process where we deal with these matters and we discuss these issues. And um, for now, the agenda is set already for next week. And as everybody knows, the priority is our emergency response to the COVID-19 crisis. I would like us to continue to stay focused on that. Um, we've been uh, spending a lot of time queuing up that presentation, and I don't want it to be um, uh, negatively influenced by this other conversation, which is clearly only half-baked. And so um, I already spoke to Councilmember Palmasano this morning and explained to her that we need more conversations between council members and department heads in order to figure out um, 
what type of support and process this discussion needs to have a different outcome at the council level, and that's not going to happen by next week on Wednesday. So I do not support a motion to bring this forward to the committee uh, by next Wednesday. Um, of course, we can continue to discuss this, and, I, and I've uh, expressed my interest in continuing to have conversations with the mayor, uh, with Lene, uh, with Councilmember Palmasano, with Councilmember Fletcher. Um, so I don't think conversations here are shut down. It's just a matter of process and time and procedure. And and um, that is not ripe or ready for next week. Thank you. Thank you. I put myself in queue, and um, thank you, Chair Palmasano. I um, my perspective is to support the the perspective of the chair. If maybe echoing Kasmar Olson's uh, perspective, it it feels a little bit like I mean I, this is a proper motion, and and we should we should vote on it. But it feels a little bit like kind of trying to achieve the same um, objective as the. Um, motion to discharge, but maybe with a lower vote threshold. Um, and I feel like we already had the discussion and vote about discharging the committee's work, um, which failed. Um, so I don't support this other uh, attempt to discharge the committee's work and, and override the decision of the committee to ask staff to do more work before a grant application is submitted. I'm concerned if a grant application has gone in without the approval of the city council is required by our rules. This is for millions of dollars of public money that should not be taking place by any department. I want to be very clear that that would apply to any department in the city of Minneapolis, and I would be extremely concerned if departments started submitting grants for millions of dollars of matching public funds or in violation of any other budget rules that we have adopted as a council. Uh, so I will follow up about that. <laughs> is there any uh, further discussion on the motion before us. Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Gordon. No. Cano. No. Reich. No. Fletcher. No. Jenkins. No. Schrader. No. Warsami. No. Ellison. No. Goodman. No. President Bender. No. There are two ayes and ten nays. The motion fails, and the committee, um, the item will remain in jur the jurisdiction of the Public Safety Emergency Management Committee under the very capable leadership of Chair Cano. The next item, uh, we do actually have two items of um, under new business. Um, both were added as amendments to our agenda. The first is a motion before you to receive the appointment by the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority Board of Commissioners of Abdi Warsami as Executive Director of the MPHA as well as to refer that nomination to the Housing Policy and Development Committee for further con consideration. Um, and this has been done in coordination with Chair Gordon and others, uh, members of the committee, as much as I was able to catch people uh, yesterday afternoon after receiving the communication from MPHA uh, during a busy day. Uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, I will just um, comment briefly um, at part of my discussion with Chair Gordon about adding this to today's agenda. There were two considerations that we talked about. Um, one was that, as I mentioned in the amendment earlier, uh, the interim director is leaving to take a new job, and there are a number of reasons that um, this agency um, is um, hopeful that they can um, have their new director in place in time to have a smooth transition. Um, this is a, one of the other areas of public life where COVID-19 is a consideration for our community members who live in public housing, many of whom are seniors. And I know Councilmember Warsami and his role as council member is already engaging on that issue, uh, as well as a number of um, budget related issues, maintenance issues. So um, we wanted to be supportive of the agency in, in being in, uh, having a smooth transition of leadership. Uh, the second consideration was that um, and bringing this forward today as an amended walk-on item was that um, there had been a lot of public discussion already, um, you know, in the media, in our own committee meetings at the MPHA. They had a public hearing there as the board, and so we felt comfortable that um, this item was in the public realm, the public knowledge for a significant period of time. So it'll be referred to the HPD committee uh, next week, and then go to the full city council meeting on Friday for consideration. Um, I know that the clerk's office has been working on the issues related to having a potential um, absence of uh, resignation uh, of the Ward 6 Council member. And so um, we will, I think, work with Councilmember Ellison to schedule 
a briefing about uh, any upcoming election or other things related, but please know that our clerk's office has been very proactive in working with City Enterprise, with talking with the um, Secretary of State's office, and getting ourselves ready for a potential special election. So I uh, wanted to make those comments. Is there anything further on that? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. That carries and the motion is adopted and will be referred to the next meeting of the Housing Policy and Development Committee. The second item is the one that I added, um, which I can't find right now, which is a motion, um, which is a staff direction related to COVID-19. And again, um, I wanted to bring this forward today to reflect some of the discussion that happened in um is happening in ongoing department head conversations, in leadership meetings, um, and by no means is this an exhaustive reflection of the city of Minneapolis's preparations for reacting to COVID-19 and supporting our staff, ourselves as policymakers and our, and our own staff in our offices and our community. Uh, Mayor Fry and I have been in contact today. Um, so there will either be a press, uh, I believe that the governor's office and the state department of health will be making an announcement um, early this afternoon, um, sharing some more health guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health. We and all of the other public agencies in Minnesota are looking to MDH for their expertise and guidance on um, preparations related to community health. So they'll be sharing more information about that this afternoon. Um, I, I believe the city will then also have a separate communication uh, opportunity this afternoon um, for us to share more about our own preparations uh, after that um, more health focused uh, announcement takes place. Um, I want to let my colleagues know, um, reiterating some things that I sent in an email yesterday that were communicated during a leadership meeting that we had. Um, first of all, that our staff have been um, having very frequent uh, phone calls and meetings as department heads, preparing ourselves as a workplace to make sure that our work um, force is protected and healthy. Uh, we are currently in what I've been calling a prepare and accommodate phase, uh, following the guidance of MDH, where we're making preparations in the case that folks need to be working from home. We're making preparations, cataloging all of the public meetings that are coming up in every single department in the city, assessing each of them, and communicating um, any kind of alternative format or call-in options for folks. Um, there are health advisories for those um, over the age of 60 or with pre-existing conditions, and we want to honor um, pe people's personal choices and accommodate uh, folks who choose or cannot uh, attend public meetings. Um, so all of that work is underway. There's been significant preparation to support our own workforce, reviewing our own leave policies to, with an eye toward being as supportive as possible as our staff, um, dealing with um, health directives or um, things out of their control like um, family members. Um, so in the spirit of all the work that we've done on, on our own leave policies, those discussions are happening. Um, the IT department is working hard to prepare our workforce for the potential of um, working from home. Um, departments are working to identify you know, how they would structure staffing in the uh, event of changing um, guidelines around our workforce or decisions that the city would make around our own workforce. Um, an email went out about the preparations that the building commission is making for our own workspaces and um, related to sanitizing and some recommendations for us and our staff to follow as well. Um, and so this... Uh, uh, long, and then I do also want to say that we have the closed session coming up specific to those health and security related um, issues and questions so that our staff can share and we can ask questions. The public health committee will have a public discussion on Monday. The public safety will have a public discussion on Wednesday. Um, of course, our emergency management staff are working closely with first responders to ensure that they are protected, that we have what we need in place for them. Um, and then this um, staff direction is specific to supporting our departments in the work that is already underway for them to be supportive of community members who might have economic impacts from um, changes um, related to the COVID-19 response. So in addition to internal preparations to support the health and well-being of the city of Minneapolis employees, staff in all city departments are directed to take steps to ensure Minneapolis residents and businesses are supported during any economic impacts of COVID-19. The city attorney's office is directed to investigate the city's authority to take actions that would support residents and businesses through any economic and health impacts of COVID-19 in Minneapolis in coordination with the city of Minneapolis departments and external partners. This should include the preparations underway, such as housing stability tools, support for residents experiencing 
homelessness, shelter preparations, and preparations with partners who supply housing, supporting healthy homes and businesses by ensuring the continued supply of water to homes and businesses, and reaching out to partners who supply energy to homes and businesses in the event of economic hardships, cataloging, preparing, and communicating existing support available to residents or businesses who are experiencing economic hardship, and exploring additional tools in partnership with public and private sector partners, and working through IGR networks to support partnerships at all level of government to support residents, visitors, and businesses. So this was intended and shared um, with department heads um, to give them, again, the support that they need to um, continue with work that's already happening. Every single thing on this list is happening already um, through the leadership of many staff in many departments. I really want to commend them for their compassionate and swift response to thinking about those folks in our community who are most vulnerable, who may be affected by any kind of economic impacts. Uh, we're learning from other cities. We have some advantage here of time. So we're watching what's happening in Seattle and learning from their support of small businesses and members of the community. I've seen a number of cities across the state start to um, ensure that water will be continued to be supplied and our, our public works department is working on that. So this just gives our staff that insurance that their policymakers are behind them and with them on those preparations. So thank you for the indulgence of a lot, sharing a lot of information. Again, look forward to the discussion at the closed session as well. Is there any further discussion on this staff direction? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. I, any opposed say no, that carries. Um, so then um, that uh, concludes our business. We have the order of announcements. Are there any announcements from council members? Seeing none, uh, we've concluded all of our business from the council today. Um, we do have a motion in front of you for a closed session related to the security security briefing on emergency response procedures related to the COVID-19 virus. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to, three night, th to room 315 for that closed session. Uh, we do not uh, take public testimony at our meetings, but I'm happy to talk to members of the public who are here after the meeting. Is there any discussion? Oh, I see. I appreciate the discussion. We've um, discussed this uh, at length with our city attorney and our clerk. I'm happy to respond to these concerns and I take them very much to heart. We have several uh, upcoming public communications, including a planned press event that I believe the mayor's office is, is leading for later today after the health department, the public meeting on Monday, as well as a public meeting on Wednesday. I assure everyone that there is no intention of secrecy here, um, that this is a uh, timing issue and an issue related to making sure that my colleagues have the support that they need in, in part as employees of the city of Minneapolis. So I'm happy to defer to the um, clerk or to the um, city attorney, but we will also, uh, we always discuss this as the beginning of the closed session, which is open to the public. So you and others are welcome to be there for the uh, beginning of the open session. And I think perhaps that's the best um, venue to take this up. Uh, so uh, I'll, is there a motion? Your motion okay. to close the meeting. All those in favor say aye. I, any opposed say no. Uh, Discussion. Okay. I, I, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, President Bender. I just wanted to note that there is a uh, celebration of the Kmart uh, yes. across the hall, and so I wondered if my colleagues might want to uh, call a half hour recess so that uh, the public that was invited uh, to that event and uh, have the closed session begin at 1130. Ah, thank you. That's a great idea. Uh, so uh, I will take that um, uh, suggestion and we will adjourn um, our meeting until 1130 in room 315. Um, that will begin the, op the open public portion of the closed session. Uh, and with that, um, we, we already voted. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>